Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome tonight. My name is James, and I work as a bookseller here. Um, I want to introduce, uh, I want to welcome you all to the event tonight and introduce Mr. Kevin Gallagher, who is uh, launching with Karina Van Berkham, the eighth iteration of Spoke Magazine, a poetry annual. So um, without further ado, here's Kevin Gallagher. Thanks, James. It's so great to be here in person with all of you and see your warm bodies and also great to see all of you out there. Not that I can't, I can see you, but, but you can see, you can see me, but not us. We have standing room only, uh, as usual, uh, here at the Grolier. Great to be, great to be back at the Grolier. Uh, we have, we have done a reading for every single one of our issues at the Grolier since we started. And this one is eight, number eight, our eight ball in the corner pocket issue. Uh, we're super excited. To, uh, to, to launch Spoke 8 this weekend. And this is a Spoke 8 weekend. You can come here tonight. And if you didn't get enough tonight, we're gonna do a visual, uh, excuse me, a virtual only tomorrow night with Lit Bomb. I'll tell you more about that uh, at, the, at the end of the evening. So we were, uh, 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 let me give a short introduction to what you'll be able to find in, in Spoke 8. And then I'll talk about who our readers are for, for this evening. Um, Spoke seeks to advance a better existence in the world through poetry and poetics. Founded in response to the Boston Marathon bombing, we are strong to advance a global poetry that engages with or is from the world's places, cultures, and literary traditions, past, present, and visions of futures. Two, an American poetry that sees the English language and literary tradition as core, but only one of many roots and paths for poetry. And three, a poetics that attempts to innovate language, idiom, sensibility, and poetic form while maintaining a public presence. In the tradition of one of Boston's greatest magazines, Sid Corman's Origin, we go deeply into a few poets, regions, and cultures in each issue. We're proud to exhibit Wang Ping's translations from across contemporary China in geographical space and in identity. And in tomorrow night's reading at Lit Bomb, Wang Ping and some of these Chinese poets uh, beaming in from China will be reading virtually tomorrow night at five o'clock. Philip Nikolaya, whose transitions, translations of Pushkin appeared in Spoke 7, brings 20 pages of new translations of Ossip Mandelstam for this number eight. Philip was supposed to read tonight, but unfortunately he's not, uh, he's not gonna be able to make it, so he won't be reading, but the, but the, but the English of the Mandelstam is in this issue. Ben Mazur helps us rethink Delmore Schwartz through newly discovered poems from the next Genesis to essays on Schwartz's work, including essays about Schwartz's verse plays, uh, Schwartz's relationship with Lou Reed uh, and many others, uh, as, as well as James Joyce. We also have a special section edited by Olena Jennings. If you read Spoke 7, Olena was one of the co-editors of a special section that we did on translations of Ukrainian poetry. She's also part of the Queens poetry scene in Queens, New York, and she has a special section in this issue on new poets from Queens. And of course, once again, we serialize, I think for the fourth issue in a row, Amanda Cook's uh, letters to Maximus, her responses to the Maximus poems. Uh, some of the work that's featured in Spoke 8 is forthcoming in, in book form with Mad Hat Press, Delmore Schwartz and the Chinese translations by Wang Ping. We, all we also shout out Mad Hat's new re release, My Deniversity, his memoirs of life with and around the great Denise Levertov, stemming from their years together at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and beyond. We're proud to have published earlier versions of these in Spoke 6. Mad Hat's editor, Mark Vincennes, who I think is out there, is an important and needed poet in his own right. And we're proud to blast a spotlight on the selection of Marx's poems alongside a discussion of his work by Robert Archambault and Philip Nikolaev in this issue. Uh, Mark Vincennes will be reading tomorrow night also in the Lit Bomb feature. Also with great pride, we celebrate and exhibit the work of Carol Weston. Carol has been, a, has been legendarily active in, in the Boston area for decades. And she has never received the ink we all need from her and that she deserves. There are now many efforts to chronicle the career and work of this great poet. Thanks to John Mulroney and others, he who uh, made spoke part of, it, part of those efforts. 
we go deep into Mulroney on spoke six, and he's going to share some of his work with us tonight. A number of the Philip Guston retrospectives were set to be unveiled in 2020, including here in Boston. But their curators pulled the shows in response to the latest racial atrocities and subsequent post protests. The global response by artists, writers, poets, and Guston's family has prompted the organizers to bring the shows back just a tad quicker, but still reveal their lack of understanding of Guston's late work. While most in the art community abandoned Guston when he moved away from abstract expressionism, as they called it, poets embraced him. The poet Calvin Coolidge was a friend of Guston's, wrote a book with Guston, and edited Guston's collected writings just a few years ago. We're happy to share a short interview with Clark Coolidge in this issue about his experiences with Philip Guston, uh, as well as a, one of the Philip Guston Calvin Coolidge collaborations or poem pictures that you can find uh, in here as well. We also have a, a, a published, a previously published essay by the Boston poet William Corbett, who wrote a book on Guston's late work in, by, in, published by Zolan Press. Uh, and he had a special section on Guston's paintings about the Klan. And uh, he nailed it many years ago about what's going on uh, right now. And we're also really proud to have about 30 pages of new poems that Calvin Coolidge, excuse me, Clark Coolidge. Did I say Calvin Coolidge this whole time? <laughs> I did? Oh my gosh. On camera. Uh, Clark, if you're out there, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to make you a president. I know that's an insult for you. Um, Clark Coolidge. Uh, we're excited to have 30 pages, uh, the, the, the most recent work by Clark uh, that uh, he's been working on during COVID. We also have Wong Ping's own poems and an essay by her on Gary Snyder. Uh, Peter Valente is back in a way in an essay on Basil King. And Ifeanyi Minkiti, who is on the cover of the last issue, which we dedicated to him. And obviously he is the great, uh, great overseer of this place uh, right now. He has a new book coming out of his posthumous work and we have uh, a long poem in there which is the title track of his new book. William Doreski shares a memoir of someone else we lost in this region uh, recently, Stratus Javiaris, uh, shares Stratus's uh, experience here. He's the Greek poet who moved to the era uh, and founded Arion's Dolphin in the 1970s that later turned into Harvard, the Harvard Review that he edited. We're happy to bring back Ariel Ruth and meet her for the first time. Guy Rotella, Joe Tora, Mark Lamoureux, and many others. And then there is Ruth Lepston. There are no words, but her new and selected poems that are reviewed here. I want to introduce to you John Mulrooney. As I mentioned before, he we did a big feature on his great work a couple issues ago. Uh, he's going to read a few of his own poems and introduce Carol Weston. Thank you so much, Kevin. I'm going to read. Alvin Coolidge, Clark Coolidge, right. <laughs> right, somewhere in there. Well, it's a long, it's a, it's a really big issue, right? There, there might be some Calvin Coolidge phones just hanging out in there, There's right? No but we don't, we're not even sure, right? Why is that a typo on Clark? I'm checking here. Clark, 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 Clark. Clark. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read two poems, uh, and then it is my my honor to uh, uh, to, to introduce Carol to you. Um, even though she really needs no introduction. This poem is from the new issue. It's uh, all conjunctions aspire to be. <laughs> conjunction, there's uh, um, across the marsh, twilight fades, night sky gazing back at your gaze with a wink that promises an even greater conjunction than you have. The industrial park squanders a few shimmers on cantilevered windows, and there are fewer of us now, which makes the stars seem greater in number, harder to count. 
But Saturn startles us, and then we almost recall when we knew to ask, aren't we the gods who can know the particular confirms the general? This beauty in the sky makes all skies beautiful? Who can know that it is necessary there are those who fall into the abyss, just as it is necessary there are those who reach into the abyss? We were waiting to find the way to cross that parking lot, learning to want to cross it like the first mariners did on shore, a wedge of geese like a ship in the sky, almost no one on the bike path today. Now we truly move like ghosts. Ornette sings, friends and neighbors, that's where it's at. Friends and neighbors, that's where it's at. And he's right. The bodies shuffle in their wide berth, the dusk and winter, indistinguishable from the dawn, a light, always and elsewhere and other, we are born with an absence missing that we cannot even see, that we cannot know, but how we know loss when first it kisses us and it dances around us, swirls and is the story of its swirling, sails around us and is the story of its sailing. And it says, hey sailor, don't you want to be startled enough to want to scrub seen and feel clean and give the missing an exact name? Gem Spa, Once Ballroom, The Second Spanish Republic, Rena Miguel Christie, Tom Tullis, Brian Kelly, and not to be struggling to be overwhelmed 400,000 times when you really want to believe just once would do. Of course, it's not 400,000 anymore, it's far more, but Paul's a few months old. Uh, do you all know the great poet Joe Saravolo? You should know the great poet Joe Saravolo. Um, so this is, a, this is a poem, um, and you all know the Bee Gees, right? So, I think I'll call this poem, the great poet Joe Saravolo made home recordings and didn't turn the radio off. That I am afraid and fear is a bulbous void growing within me that will burst and that I am afraid a void will obliterate me or suffocate me or that it is not a void but a grenade of even more trouble that will burst and shatter all with shrapnel that it is a presence, a shape like a sudden bout of stomach ache before you know how bad it's going to get. But today is a day to listen to terms of psychic warfare and recall the architecture of other mornings, how their promise prompted recordings that made a new shape of the day, primitive recordings of a day way back in the past when I knew what it was to be the youngest in the tribe and be the first to learn about the antelope from the cave painting before seeing its breath plume around its quivering nostrils on a cold morning. Before the instrument of my body learned it was a drum to anticipate days to come and not the other way around to know then as I did know that I would never be part of the tribe again, that it is raining all the time here and it seems the whole world is burning and that we are naming the fires like we used to name the rain, that it is not who could do now, but you reading in your bedroom over the sound of the Bee Gees, that you have a quaver in your voice that sounds like a fear I know, but it is not a fear I know because it is not afraid to read over the Bee Gees in the radio, their saccharine song of desperate men trapped within the mines of New York which was thought more glamorous than Aberthon, that I am afraid of the mines in my own head and all the miners in them trapped and dying that they stay silent to conserve oxygen and are so afraid to sing that they too are surrounded by sleep and want to sing like you do of weeping rivers and the lonesome dogs and the chatter of birds wings but are afraid to burst the void that is or is not a void that is the nothing or the something that is worse than nothing that they are not prepared for what to do in the event of something happening to me. And um, with that, okay. I'm really um, most of you, I think uh, most most people here probably have some sense of Carol Weston. But Carol Weston has, well, from my own introduction, she it's, it's only a couple of miles from BU um, to Beacon Hill. But the journey that Carol Weston took from her classes with Robert Lowell to the magic evenings that Stephen Jonas hosted uh, in his apartment near the Massachusetts State House spanned the length and breadth of American poetry. Uh, she's energized poetry in this town and in the New England community with her presence for more than five decades. She was originally from Brookline uh, and she spent most of her life here. Um, although she has uh, did spend time in New York, uh, she worked in occupational therapy at Pilgrim State Hospital um, in uh, Colorado, where she befriended Stan and Jane Brockage. Um, in the Breadloaf Writers Conference, she began her association with the British poet George Barker, 
Um, and as you know, in that and in that that particular crew around Jonas, which included John Reeners and included Joe Don, and Jack Spicer and Robin Blazer, she was really one of the very few women who was who was part of that group. Um, and she's been, if, if any of you are familiar with the Stone Soup uh, uh, poetry uh, events that have spanned uh, decades in this town, going from Jack Powers, I think we might have met actually at a Stone Soup uh, decades ago, um, that Jack Powers ran for many years and Chad Parento still continues to run a version of Carol has been probably one of the longest running uh, members of that community. Uh, her work, is infused with the spirit of shamanism. It's a, a declarative witness that can conjures unadorned essentials. Her readings are enactments of the effect, a, 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 ethereal that fit well with today's performance poetry and also harken back to our earliest oral traditions. It's electrifying to be in the room when Carol reads, uh, the pipes know. Um, and those who have attended these performances, which have taken place at our most august institutions and some of our best dive bars, are in the presence of something otherworldly that helps us navigate this world. She has called herself in a poem I was helping type up just today, a stenographer for the queen inside her head. And she is not responsible for her mistakes, but she is going to share some of them with us now. Please <laughs> welcome Carol Weston. On my own. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm indebted to so many people. I don't know what to do about it. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Oh God, wait a minute. Uh, the notebook. <laughs> um. Anyway, so I am indebted to so many people, and um, I better get started quick because. Um, oh, I, I, I got all excited about listening to my stuff. <laughs> anyway, oh, here it is. Okay. I'm indebted to Ben Bellet at Bennington College, who gave us the notebooks of Gerard Manley Hopkins, complete with sketches and assigned us to write inscapes, little intense observations of chickens and deer. And he gave us the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci, leaving Bennington after three, leaving Bennington after three semesters was the worst thing I ever did. At BU, I landed in Lowell's class, such a sensibility I adored. But he went around the class asking, what have you been reading? And I screamed and fell to the floor. What, why was I majoring in comparative literature with a colossal reading problem? I'm indebted to George Barker, the British poet at Red Rose Writers Conference at Middlebury College. Uh, 59 and beyond, and to the anthologist Oscar Williams, who recorded me for a record, and to Tambi Muthu from Ceylon, editor of Poetry London, London, New York, um, in Greenwich Village. I am debted to J J Jack Powers, founder of Stone Soup in 1971, when I came back to Boston from Boulder, and I truly am. I'm, whoops. Now, where is he? Already? Yeah. I think he's right in the ground. Oh, there. okay. And now I am indebted to John Mulroney, who connected the dots of my life as no one has ever done before. A special genius, he and Rachel. I am indebted to John Galloway, an ast astrophysicist and poet who has to listen to all this and celebrated the first day of his 90th year in two days. Oh, celebrates. <laughs> Whoa, that's 
the end of that. Okay. And um, so, oh, damn it. I forgot to look at the time, but you'll tell me. So these are the poems that it to be in spoke. Afraid of the throngs of cognoscenti. Burning with isolation, I stood eating potato chips among the throng, throngs of cognoscenti. A hair, a hair is the fine string that brings us invisible music. Blue speck. I am that one millimeter blue speck that floats on tide pools. And I look up under the great rose light that spreads across the sky. Chip. Look into the fog of that dark harbor of your being, and you will see the contour of great ships that are waiting. The street. Ever since the women with bundles walked down the center of my street, I have been bent double from the sight of their hollow hands. I lie down with the lightning. I lie down with the lightning and suck the nectar and ambrosia of other worlds. Oh, this is serious. I look at my watch. My darling time, you are eating me alive, and I love it. And this is sad. Rope. You do not understand why my friend Joan wound you around her neck, nor why she jumped. <clears throat> if you should fire me, if you should fire me from the job, you could not fire the fire from me that lashes me internally. Now, let's see. Okay, oh yeah, this title has changed. Um, <coughs> um, this is my, um, just a minute, my 3.5 billion years old birthday. Spark, you seized prehistory by the scruff of the neck. My name is Care All Quest On. I am born of lightning. 3.5 billion years ago today, starting with the first cell upon the waters. I am primordial. I live on the land before there were names, the supercontinent Pangaea. Every form of life that ever lived lives in my body. I am exhausted as my breathing moves the mountains of my mind. I move with love for all the forms of life inside me. It's strange to live inside an aging mortal's skin. I am arthritic. Come over here and listen to my bones. This pile of exultant consciousness has turned to poison on the floor. I have nowhere to step. How can I stand up straight enough to ram, wrap my arms around the 864,000 mile diameter of the sun? Instant. This instant is the space over the candle flame where no flame shows and everything that enters here burns into ashes. Mountain. I am a horse, old and slightly gray, slowly farting up the mountain of Parnassus. To Garrett, what is it about this man of magic? He flows with the tides, keeps in touch with the moon, knows the lives of the creatures, the books of the alchemists. rises at dawn. This is to Linda Crane. I don't know how many of you know her. Zen Buddhist and leader of shamanic journeys. Linda, 
On your 23rd birthday, you threatened to pull the telephone out of the wall and you put your foot into your birthday cake. At 46, with cancer unknown in your body, you cross, crawled across the floor inside a bear skin, the bear, your power animal. Your shamanic journeys touch a thousand lives. The deer of your being dance through the, through the wolves of your death. Young Bomber of the Marathon, to Sarnaya, a shamanic vision. You went up to the sun and out the other side, then into the sperm whale's jaw and stomach and out of his mouth. The microscopic creatures. <clears throat> High in the sky, I asked you, who are your friends? the microscopic creatures in the clouds, you answer. So then I worked in children's safety. The largest mental hospital in the world. Uh, so that, I got there, 59. Toilet paper floating in the trees, eyes looking out from behind bars. A thousand people walking side by side, two by two, in the afternoon to the movies. Sunsets in Brentwood, Brentwood are like the paintings of Poussin, said Mr. Stander, the aristocratic patient. My friends think that I am in Europe. I learned the Lord's Prayer at age two, said the black blind boxer. Jack Johnson never paid me back my $500. In the sewing shop, a woman with white powder on her face and rouge, who had danced professionally in New York City, pretended to fence with her knitting needle. The judge was there for trying to assassinate Thomas E. Dewey. He taught me that the ginkgo with cone-shaped leaves is a very ancient tree. One very gentle man who told me he spent the weekend with his best friend, a book, was there for murdering his wife. Bill Inch, part Indian, seven feet tall. Let me address you. We went through buildings 25 and 81 with the library cart singing, I, I ride an old paint, your prison record. Let's see, till my boss in OT looked up your prison record and I went out to you on your bench on the grounds and burst into tears to tell you that I could no longer work with you. Turchin, you read for the patient program, poetry program your poem, Time Has a Tinsel Voiture. It never lasts out the day. You sculpted from wood the Asclepian snake of medicine and wore it around your neck. Henry Basque maker, basket maker in the ceramic shop, you taught me not to cut a branch back but let it die naturally. Chef, who had a lobotomy, you wore fresh evergreen every morning in your lapel and brought forth 30 pots a day on the potter's wheel. Molly had a suitcase. Molly had a suitcase of poems that had been turned down by poetry magazines, she said. I had to leave my work after three years at the hospital because I screamed under pressure from my boss in occupational therapy who wouldn't allow me to run the patient po poetry program during work hours. When I left the hospital, Molly, with a suitcase of fun, committed suicide. 
toilet paper floating in the trees, eyes looking out from behind the bars, a thousand people walking side by side, two by two in the early afternoon to the movies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. That was wonderful. I'm so glad you're here. Um, and thanks everyone for coming out. I'm Karina and uh, I'm uh, me and Kevin are the creators of this really small, light little issue. Um, it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce my friend Matthew Porto tonight, who will be reading next. Matthew uh, holds an MFA in poetry from Boston University and a PhD in English from Texas Tech University. His work has recently appeared in Poet Lore, American Literary Review, Salamander, and elsewhere. He lives in Boston, and uh, I consider him a good friend. Uh, he was in uh, at the BU program with me, and um, I'm thrilled that he's in this issue. And uh, please welcome Matthew Porto. <laughs> Thank you, Karina. And Kevin and Karina, thank you so much for, for Spoke and for including me in Spoke. And uh, thanks everyone for being here. And the other readers, that, that, was, in, that was incredible. Um, I feel very lucky to be, uh, to be reading with these folks tonight. Um, I'm going to read a, a few poems from uh, what is effectively my first collection, uh, which is not published yet, uh, but is it was sort of the basis yes. of my yet. I did say yet. Um, I'm not in despair tonight, uh, <laughs> but uh, it was sort of the basis of my. Oh, I suppose I could take the mask off. That's nice. Um, that's what I look like. <laughs> uh, um, so it's sort of the. It was the basis of my my dissertation work uh, during the PhD. Was you know, I was lucky enough to be working on poetry and also an academic degree. And that's why I did it um, is for that opportunity. So um, I'll read a few poems. Um, and I don't think I need to say much about them, but the, the title of the book is um, Moon Grammar. Uh, and the books, there's a, an angel figure that appears in many, of the, in many of the poems in the book. And you'll sort of see this figure. Um, and I think otherwise it's fairly self-explanatory. This poem is called The Angel After Eden. When I saw what he'd made in the garden, I felt I'd fallen on my own sword. Harsh light passed through the very center of my body. I was one of the few of my kind who loved them, though they were pathetic, huddled under a terebinth in the empty crescent, Eve exhausted and suddenly aware she was pregnant, Adam wiping her forehead with his sweaty palm. Then time came, slouching through the crescent's empty valleys, out of crystalline rivers, dragging shame, guilt, and terror by a tight woven rope. Eve ran her fingers along her belly, tracing a circle. Adam stood, his muscles tightening. They were not harmed, only followed. When the baby tore through her, I was sure she would die. Time and its retinue looked on from one bank, I from the other. She lived, and the child too. Time was, as always, indifferent, blank-faced. What I felt was pride, as if I had made something, having gathered the words to describe their image. My sword fell to my side its flame quenched. The angel descends to Jacob. This refers to the incident in the, in the Old Testament, many of you probably already know, uh, in which Jacob wrestles uh, the angel. Very tiny moment too, it's a few lines, but it's a pretty fascinating moment. The angel descends to Jacob. The whole of creation's drama before me, the wheel and what turns it, 
starlight on turned soil, stones clenched in riverbeds, crystal, pines that reach the road wrapping the mountain, a serpent waiting for twitchy prey beneath a cedar. What man has made now makes him. I follow my first human thought like a scent. I find the patriarch at the shore where the ocean offers up an endless sacrifice of shoal, shell, and seaweed. The sand takes the press of the struggle, whirls at each wing beat. He bleeds at the forearm and knee, his soft flesh purples below the jaw from a chokehold. Bright dust falls from my feathers as the present pours into the eyes of contender and contender, leveled in exhaustion. We straddle sand, hands on hips, heads bowed to pelvis, lapping air. Crab shadow, shadow of doom there at the sea's altar, the literal where even sunlight rests. Collecting myself, I take off for the Empyrean. Below, every laughing, hulking thing shoulders the wheel. Road swallows mountain, starlight pines all. Israel, I named him, the one who believes all that is, is God's, and fights it anyway. My last human thought before the world vanishes. The angel after Jacob. I was there looking on, my head tilted and backlit, when he, the capital H, when he first filled the trough that became Euphrates. I saw Adam's flank cut, tracked his footprints leaving Eden, and Eve wailing beneath a tamarisk, the first fruit of human labor. But nothing matched the feel of Jacob's hands warm on my throat, the taste of his breath, I saw light and dark and the onset of dawn and the patriarch's purpling skin until I understood that for the best of you, a wound is an opportunity. Now it is easier to recognize his love for you. You are repulsive at times, yes, but there is starlight in your bruises, whole galaxies in your shiners. For us, a wound is only a sweet confusion, a glass of wine on an empty stomach. Poem is in three short parts. Moon Grammar, Jacob in Mourning. One, nights were the most difficult, all that moonlight menacing our camp until the vastly pigs came to life with pale stretched shadows for branches, with clumps of empty dark for foliage, and the faces of my other sons asleep were shuffling back from the hunt turned to spectral outlines against gray. Night after night, the moon brought back the image of his face years before at our well, upturned, angular, not yet bearded, soaking in shed radiance, one sinewy arm stiff on the ground, the other relaxed against the well curb, his chest bare where his robe had fallen. Two, I couldn't see my son in memory otherwise, only that moonlit face and body far from me on the night I accused him of worshiping a false god. Too smart for us all, even at his age. He said we all spoke in moon grammar, sliding thoughtlessly over distinctions, chanting our histories in the present tense. Abraham goes down to Egypt. Isaac is led up the mountain by the hand. I warned his tutor, Eliza, that the boy would become changeable as the moon, a mystery even to us. Three, when we finally found him, he was on a foreign stage in full sun, his beard lit like new moss, his performance perfect. I, I couldn't see my son in all that light, but when he came to my room that evening, it was my own father come back to see me, to tell of his near sacrifice. It was Yahweh come, weeping over Adam and an empty garden. That's it. Thank you.
you, Matthew. That was wonderful. Um, our final reader for tonight is Ariella Ruth, who I'm thrilled to introduce. I, I sadly do not have a bio for her, but she kindly allowed me to make one up. Um, so I'm going to say uh, Ariella Ruth was born in a remote uh, Sicilian village. Um, she is uh, a, a Pisces for sure, and moonlights as a trapeze performer. But in all seriousness, um, her poem, uh, Color A Way Through, is one of my favorites in this issue, and I'm so glad she's here tonight. Please welcome Ariel Ruth. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's all true, right? All of it, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually a Scorpio, but my daughter's a Pisces, so okay. so that's something. Um, and about the trapeze artist, there's like Bob Dylan had this great quote, like, um, I don't call myself a poet because I don't like the word. I'm a trapeze artist. So, so I was so, right about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, both of you. and. Um, and Kevin for the invitation. Okay. I'll start with the poem um, that was mentioned in my bio uh, that's in this issue number eight. Color, a way through. The body knows to bear down, surprisingly so. I wear a ring of your saliva around my neck proud of pain sung, where your tears collect and settle, souls pressed against the wall above the faucet, so loudly. Yellow leaf in the bathtub, you twirled earlier between your fingertips. I fed you in open air, in the park, color, a way through, remember? I prefer to face the sun so you don't have to. Little ghosts. <laughs> Aveline's hair is the focal point on the baby monitor, strikingly dark, which is so surprising, surprising given her light brown sun-kissed curls that run wild in daylight. I stare at her fuzzy erratic locks and notice the length of her body sprawled diagonal across the bed. Her birth feels not long ago, though she is now nearing 20 months of life and is newly enamored with language, full of enthusiasm and the realization that she has a voice, that language varies significantly with volume and pitch. I frequently revisit the moments leading up to her birth and her birth moment itself I spent the months prior halted with fear of those laborious moments. Is there a proper name for the kind of labor that follows the novel birth of a mother? The birth that comes after a crescendo of shock to the system, near deceased, spent and breathless. Shortly after Aveline's arrival, the color leaves my face. I faint twice, then the hemorrhaging begins. The midwife whose shift starts amidst the chaos is tasked with manually removing blood clots from my uterus. Aveline sleeps swaddled and folded in her daddy's arms in the corner chair against the wide window that overlooks the Charles River. Bodies struggle to know what to do once the birthing is done. I often meditate on that swift vanishing of color is this what led to the newfound invisibility since my mother birth? My iron levels are back to normal, but I notice my hair has gone dull and sleepless. My voice now received as quiet, is hoarse with words ravaged in misunderstanding and falters even when I promise you I'm screaming. A fortress of pillows surrounds Aveline to keep her from spilling off the bed. Our bed linens are an array of vibrant tie-dyed cotton, but are muted to patternless white and gray through the lens of the baby monitor. 
mist from the humidifier swirls past the lens to form little ghosts that pattern around the darkened bedroom. Milk wet. Mother is a frayed cloth spiral, unwrapped and fa fallen to ground. The untidiness is unnerving. Mother is recoiled and tucked away until tomorrow. Mother is sent to temperature, warm and milk wet. Mother must herself be well mothered. Baby knows mother not as an extension of herself, but as herself. Mother goes to baby's room to dance and thrash, headbang at night while baby sleeps starfish and starfished in mother's bed. Mother takes up hula hooping to process the trauma of motherhood. Mother feels at home in this circular shape. A long time ago, mother came to accept the notion that bodies accommodate babies. Baby nestles her feet between mother's lower ribs and spins her toes. That's the same way mother cozies up to find sleep so she understands. Mother sacrifices lungs to indefinite exposure when the rib cage expands to encompass baby's growth. This is normal. Mother cannot ruminate on the rawness of mother's hearts in constant sunlight. I'm gonna read one of my poems from the last issue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Strawberry Girl. We feel the remnants of a tropical storm moving north. Everything unbalanced, pinkened sky blown in all directions. I briefly remember I have a body. The wind is coarse. You screech so loudly as you play, so happy to experience your own intentional movement. The cat and I go to the balcony to breathe. The sky is misshapen. On nights when you cry so intensely, I feel your suffering in my own body. The tree branch closest to our living room window flails in harmony with the storm. All these years, I didn't know who I was writing to. The night my own body held its wickedest anguish, not my fever nor my water broke how ready you were. I'm so desperately in love with you. I think it may always be that way. This is my last one that was written this afternoon. <laughs> performance notes. One, this performance is one of survival. Two, motherhood is tireless. Three, poetry requires stamina. Four, strive to be unapologetically significant. Five, emanate growth. Six, remember the impermanence of two forces of life. Seven, recall the transient organ of roots and limbs. Eight, write into the space you should, will forget and greet the rage. Nine, get a larger pantry to accommodate my body, writing. 10, let's get this bloody show on the road. Thank you. <laughs> and all that was, uh, was just terrific. Thanks so, thanks so much, everyone, and, and thanks, everybody. For coming uh, out there and and in here, uh, if you liked what you heard, uh, we have a whole bunch of copies of Spoke Eight and most of uh, most of the back issues uh, right up here at the cash register. And you can hear more people from Spoke Read tomorrow night. Uh, so if you go to the if you if you Google Lit Bomb, it's a wonderful uh, reading series that uh, has been five o'clock on Saturdays almost throughout the entire COVID. That's lit. B-A-L-M. Yes, as in lip balm. It's a lit balm. L-I-T-B-A-L-M. 
uh, you can you can go through their web page onto Zoom or on Facebook, and we'll have four other readers uh, from from the issue. We'll have Mark Vincennes, who I mentioned, who's no stranger here. He's actually opening his new book here next Friday, December seventeenth. Um, and we'll have Wang Ping, the woman who I talked about, who guest edited, a, guest edited a special section of contemporary Chinese poets. And she'll be reading some of her translations and we'll also be beaming in from some of those folks uh, from China. It'll be very late in the, late in the evening or early in the morning uh, uh, for them. And we'll have a woman named Helen Ivory, an incredible poet who's in this, uh, in this new issue. And fourth, we will have the ghost of Delmore Schwartz himself. Uh, the ghost of Delmore Schwartz will be there. Uh, part of this uh, issue has a whole section of essays on Delmore Schwartz and Ben Mazur, who edited this section, discovered in his archival research a part of Genesis that was never published, the second part of Genesis. And so for the first time ever, it'll be read tomorrow night by the ghost of Delmore Schwartz. So that's on lip bomb. But let's uh, wait for tomorrow until tomorrow and let's celebrate today. I want to thank everybody for reading tonight. Uh, I want to thank my friend Karina for be doing this with me uh, year after year. It's been so great to be your friend and, and grow this uh, with you and Carol and John. Uh, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, got some extra issues up here and we'll see you tomorrow night. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, we have some book details, Kevin said. Um, if everyone can move their chairs up against the wall, that would be wonderful. We have some a little bit of wine left, some water. Great stuff, man. I get nervous. I, I whisper to Green, I get nervous when people actually read their out of the magazine. You just never know. Sometimes we, we, we edit this stuff a hundred times, but we never know. And I just know it hasn't happened yet, but you know, the last thing you want is for someone to like start reading from and then like, and they're like, this is an wait a minute, there's magic. three more pages. No, <laughs> wait, it, it looks perfect. Wait a minute, and, uh, there's three more pages. <laughs> That's when I faint. Yeah. No, it looks perfect. And it's a delight to be able to hold uh, yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I know yeah. it's nice to hold the pad. Oh. 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 Just in case they're here. here. Just walk in the dog. Carol, please take the uh, money line. Yes. 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 Yes.